Welcome to another episode of Outlook Money Stock on Financial Planning for Thoughtful Investors. Today's webinar coincides with the sixth World Investor Week that goes underway from October 10 to 15. And with us, we have our guest for this session, someone who has been in the field of corporate and personal finance for over five years now. I'm Sutit Sanyal, assistant editor, Outlook Money, your host for this session. And I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Gazal Jain, fund manager, Alternative Investments Quantum AMC. She has done her MBA in finance from NMIMS. She joined Quantum AMC in 2019, where she currently looks into Quantum's alternative investment offerings, namely gold exchange traded funds. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, given that it, this is uh, the World Investor Week, I think it can be uh, a good way for you know investors to start their investment journey. And uh, also, if you are already existing investors, uh, it's always good to revisit the fundamentals of investing so that you can be better investors. And um, that is why today we'll be speaking to you uh, about the basics of financial planning. So quickly, uh, to first give you an overview of what we'll be covering in this presentation, it's a five-step process. Uh, you know, that we think, I mean, uh, is, is a good way to actually get started on this financial planning journey. Number one, create an emergency fund. Number two, define your financial goals. Number three, save more and start now. Number four, make sure your investments beat inflation. And number five, diversify your investments. Uh, let's dive deeper into each of these now. So number one, uh, creating an emergency fund. I think... Um, we have always been told about this uh, earlier and uh, some of us took it seriously, some of us didn't. But I think COVID-19 uh, actually really has woken us up to the uh, fact that, you know, uh, emergencies or uh, calamities and, you know, things can really come out from nowhere and really catch you by surprise. And um, we know during the pandemic, of course, apart from loss of lives, there was also a uh, loss of livelihoods. And, you know, there was a lot of money and financial problems that people had to face because of job losses and, you know, the lockdowns. So, I mean, the pandemic is like a stark reminder. It's, it's you know, it should be your uh, reminder that in the future, you need never be, you know, uh, be caught unprepared, right? That's where this emergency fund comes in as the first step of, you know, your financial planning process, because uh, before you can even start saving and investing for other life goals, you need to be sure that, you know, um, you are um, prepared for any untoward uh, emergencies, health emergencies, financial emergencies that will come up. So ideally, uh, six to 24 months of your monthly expenses should be parked in very safe and very liquid uh, avenues, could be bank fixed deposits, could be liquid funds, uh, somewhere where, you know, um, uh, very little risk is taken and you can withdraw your money as and when required. Uh, moving on to step two, your financial goals. What are your financial goals? It becomes very important to, you know, define your financial goals before you can start off on this journey, because uh, only when you have an end goal in mind, you know, that's when you can start taking the steps towards it. Now, financial goals could be anything from, you know, a, a vacation to a car to a house to something more, you know, long term, uh, like a child's education, child's marriage, and even retirement, right? So first you get that in place. Post that you try and put a number to it, you know, and so that you can prioritize it and give it a timeline or a time frame, right? Because for example, a car or a house is something you would want in the next three to five years. And, you know, um, so it's a medium term plan and a medium priority, right? Or um, a dream vacation could not be as important but uh, it could be something you want to uh, save for in the next six months or one year. And then the other important long-term goals, like, you know, child's education or child's marriage. So, I mean, once you have a number to it, you know what you're working towards and you have a time frame, so you know how much time you have to achieve it. Step three is to save more. It has two parts, step three. First is to save more. Right. So usually our money cycle is such that at the end of the month, our income comes in. We spend whatever we have to, uh, you know, our household expenses, children's education, travel, etc. And then whatever is left, 
we count it as savings and we feel you know like okay we we've done our bit another way maybe that you can you know approach this is that once your income comes in you first put aside your monthly saving whatever you've decided or whatever is uh, possible and then whatever is left after saving after putting that money aside that is what you can then freely you know use for your expenses you don't have to you know feel guilty about it then right so uh, this small shift uh, in uh, you know in your approach towards savings can make a really big difference uh, in the long run so i would say choose well right and uh, when we say save people you know start saving start investing people get very um, uh, i would say uh, nervous and you know um, they think like oh my god I, i don't have that kind of money to start saving and investing you know they get so i mean i want to let them know that there is no minimum amount to start uh, saving right any amount is good to start with i mean in mutual funds monthly you can start investing with just 500 rupees right so i mean do not use that as an excuse that oh you know we don't have enough savings to get you know uh, to start investing that cannot be an excuse because um, you any amount is good to start with so yeah please uh, keep that in mind and the second step of uh, the second part of the third step of saving is start saving now right the earlier you start right the more your money can actually work for you and the more you can like you, you know uh, grow your wealth right so of course you must have heard about something uh, called the power of compounding right uh, so just to give you an idea of how this power actually works so we have uh, two uh, investors here one uh, mrs sharma who started investing at the age of 45 and mrs kotian who started investing at the age of 30 right much earlier on um Mr. Sharma is investing monthly ten thousand rupees, whereas Mrs. Kotian invested rupees five thousand. Right? Um, Mrs. Sharma invested for fifteen years till the age of sixty, uh, whereas Mrs. Kotian, because she had started earlier, she got thirty years, right, uh, till retirement, till sixty, to invest the same money. Both of them, in totality, invested an amount of eighteen lakhs. but the difference in their final corpus you know at the age of 60 uh, was very different this is assuming a 10% cagr rate here uh, you can see that mrs sharma had a, a corpus of around 41 lakhs and uh, mrs kotian had something in excess of 1 cr so what is the difference here even though mrs kotian was investing half the money uh, monthly you know than mrs sharma uh, the difference was that she got 30 years for her money to work for her whereas mrs sharma had only 15 years you know for her money to work for her and that's what has resulted in such a massive difference and that is why uh, do not take this lightly when we say start saving start investing now that is going to make you know a major difference to what your final corpus looks like moving on to step 4 uh this step may not you know uh, very uh, often be covered but i want uh, to really speak about this is because um as indians uh, our preferred um, savings avenue are fixed deposits bank fixed deposits of course a couple of reasons for that uh, we are familiar with it they are safe you know um so there's a sort of a comfort level and we think that you know we want to save and we want to save in bank fixed deposits um that's good but there's something that you need to consider you know for your long term savings and investments and that is inflation right so in this table what we've tried to do is we mapped out uh, say in the first row how the consumer spending or you know the average household spending in india has increased over the years right from 1990 to now so if you see it has increased by an annual rate of about 10% right the next row we've tried to map out how much have gold prices increased in the same period and you see they have increased by about 9.1% on the third row we try to map out how equities have increased over this same time period and we see it's close to 14% and lastly our favorite fixed deposits uh, how have they grown uh, you know over the uh, over the same time period and we see they've grown close to 6% now what does this say your expenses right are increasing by 10% whereas your money in a bank fixed deposit is increasing by 6% you're falling short of 4% right so on a inflation adjusted real return basis 
the fixed deposit is actually making you lose money it's making you lose your purchasing power in contrast if you look at equities uh, they are managing to you know beat inflation and uh, gold is more more or less keeping in line with inflation so uh, not to say that bank fixed deposits should be shunned but you should bear in mind that you know for your long term uh, investment goals you have to factor in inflation and you have to you know have exposure to asset classes that can help you beat inflation and you know preserve your purchasing power over the long term because the whole essence of invest saving and investing is that you know you will have money enough money to meet all your life's goals and objectives right going forward but if you're saving in an avenue that does not even beat inflation you're actually uh, you know um, the the whole purpose is uh, is not being met uh next is the step 5 uh the final step which is to diversify your investments right um there's something called asset allocation uh what what does it mean it means uh, we've heard the saying about don't keep all your eggs in one basket the reason for that is if that basket falls you know you're going to be left with no eggs right so the same logic actually applies to uh, the investment world right so there are different uh, different asset classes are different baskets and uh, any asset class in any given point of time could go up and down so you don't want to be losing all your money or all your eggs by putting it in one basket and that is why you put your money in different baskets let's try and understand this more so um i like to give this uh, the example of a street vendor who uh, if you see during summer season he will be you know um, selling caps and sunglasses right because that's what we need uh, during those months and the same vendor in the in the monsoon months will be uh, selling uh, uh, umbrellas right so what is he doing in a way he's diversifying his risk because if he continues to sell caps and sunglasses in monsoon he's not going to have any buyers and vice versa right so this is a very layman example but uh uh in the investment context it means that you divide your investment portfolio among different asset categories like equities bonds commodities cash so that you know um your portfolio uh does not is not over exposed to one asset class and you know the ups and downs of that asset class so uh just to you know uh, here we're going to talk about the three main asset classes or the mainstream asset classes that uh, most of us tend to uh, uh, you know invest in there's equity there's bonds debt fixed income uh, and there's gold right so equities purpose in your portfolio is long term growth right this is where your returns will actually come in from then fixed income or bonds or debt uh, uh, the purpose of this in your portfolio is regular income and stability right so what this does for you is it lowers the volatility of your portfolio the big ups and downs that you know uh, equity markets tend to have this can balance that out and lastly gold right uh, gold um, we all know we all invested in it uh, traditionally for generations uh, what it does is it diversifies against you know uh, any kind of uh, risks equity market risk or economic risk that might come up you know it's uh, lowers the downside risk of your portfolio and it's also a good store of value like we saw in the previous slide where you know it has more or less uh, moved in line with inflation so you need to have all three of these asset classes to balance the risk and return in your portfolio uh this is a very interesting slide here to drive home this point of you know why asset allocation is important we have mapped out the uh, returns of these three mainstream asset classes from the best performing to the lower performing ones uh, for each calendar year and as you can see each of these asset classes has moved up and down you know in cycles over the years why is that because each of these asset classes have different risk and return characteristics and you know and hence they respond very differently to what is happening in the economy what is happening in the markets right so there could be years when you know equity markets do very well there could be years when equity markets don't do well and gold really uh, you know does well so and you know these periods typically do not overlap that is why it becomes important to not just be invested in one asset class because that asset class could you know go through a bad year or a couple of bad years right and that is why you don't put all your eggs in one basket so um 
uh, another way to actually drive home, you know, uh, the importance of the right asset allocation. Now, uh, we've we've discussed how asset allocation is important, but within within that, you know, how much should you invest uh, in equities? How much in uh, gold and how much in bonds? That also becomes very important, and this slide kind of uh, highlights that, right? So uh, we have two people, and uh, uh, they they have uh, the goal of having a 2.2 crore retirement corpus when they retire, right? And both of them uh, start investing. Now look at their asset allocation. A uh, invests about 30% of you know his uh, money in equities, whereas B invests 60% of his money in equities, right? And uh, Mr. A invests about 60% in debt and Mr. B about 30% in debt. So you can see that Mr. B's portfolio is more heavily weighed towards equities. And then you can see the final corpus, you know, uh, uh, when they retire. So Mr. A's corpus uh, is about 1.88 crore, which is much less than what he had, you know, gold uh, wished to achieve. Uh, which was 2.2 crore. Whereas Mr. B, thanks to his higher equity exposure, you know, he managed to have close to 2.4 crore. So he met his goal, right? So this is not to say that, you know, these are not suggested asset allocations. They can differ for people based on whatever their goal is, whatever their risk appetite is, whatever their time horizon is. But in this case, since the time horizon was uh, long and the goal was retirement, you know, uh, they needed a much larger corpus. This was the kind of asset allocation that was needed. And if you get that wrong, you know, you could uh, fall short and not meet your goals. Uh, another way I wanted to drive home uh, the importance of asset allocation, because um, we tend to forget, you know, what, what's happened in the past, the ups and downs uh, the markets have given. When equity markets do well, we all get very, uh, uh, you know, excited and we want to jump on the bandwagon and, you know, earn all those returns. But um, in the recent past, uh, you know, in, in when COVID uh, actually uh, COVID nineteen the peak, or when you know the uh, when the disease was declared a pandemic. So this was in March and April of twenty twenty. So we just try to show you that someone who had hundred percent of their money invested in equities, you know, in that period, their portfolio would have fallen by about thirty percent, right? In that, in that, in that, in just those three months, if you had hundred rupees invested, you would have been left with only seventy, right? On the other hand, if you had some sort of asset allocation, uh, for example, here we've taken a 40, 40, 20 allocation to equity, debt, and gold, your downside or your loss would have been, you know, uh, limited to just eight percent. So that is the difference asset allocation can make to a portfolio. Now. Um, Having covered, you know, the five, uh, I think, basic steps of uh, getting started with your investment or financial planning journey, I want to quickly uh, touch upon mutual funds, uh, because mutual funds are, you know, are a very, can be a very convenient uh, option for investors who don't have the time, inclination, expertise to go on and select their own, you know, stocks or bonds, and uh, they want to, you know, um, uh, outsource this function to uh, professionals. So how do mutual funds work quickly? Um, a pool of investors, you know, like a group of investors come in uh, and, in, you know, contribute money, right? Um, uh, that pooled money, uh, is it goes to the fund house, right? The fund manager here uses that money to invest in securities. Now, those securities, they may be equities, bonds, gold, you know, any other uh, 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 asset class, uh, they generate returns. And then what the fund manager and the uh, mutual fund do is they pass on these uh, returns to the investors after deducting their expenses, the expenses that they charge for, you know, researching and investing on your behalf. Now, why mutual funds, right? Like I said, if you don't have the time, inclination, expertise to, you know, research your own uh, securities and invest in them, you can choose mutual funds. Uh, how, how are they helpful? Of course, there's professional research and management, right? There are, there's a whole team and, you know, uh, that, that uh, the, their very work is to research and select good securities for you, right? They're liquid. Uh, you can exit and get your money back whenever you want. There's transparency. They're well-regulated. Also, uh, you know, uh, there's a built-in diversification involved here. Uh, uh, what I mean here is... Um, 
uh, if you have 500 rupees and you want to buy a, a stock A and stock B, right? Stock A might cost you 400 rupees and stock B about 200 rupees. So you're falling short of 100 rupees uh, to be able to buy both these stocks, right? Because you just have 500 and both these stocks cost you 600. So what happens is, you, you know, you're not able to buy stock B and you buy just one stock, stock A, right? No diversification. On the other hand, you go to a mutual fund and you give the mutual fund that 500 rupees, for example. Uh, these are just numbers for illustration, of course. Uh, with that 500 rupees, the mutual fund on your behalf, you know, because it has pooled money from so many investors, can buy stock A, stock B, stock C, stock D. So with that limited money, you get exposure to more stocks, right? So that kind of a built-in diversification comes into the picture. Also, um, you can, you know, invest with limited capital via SIPs. So uh, what happens is um, that, uh, uh, I mean, something similar that, you know, to what I, uh, what I said that uh, you don't, if you want to own five stocks, you might uh, not need so much money, but uh, I mean, you might not have so much money, but uh, with an SIP, you can get exposure to many stocks with a limited amount. So, um, now we see, I mean, just to illustrate this point further, if you had rupees 2000 to invest in equities, which would you pick, right? Because all of these uh, stocks, uh, you know, uh, they have different share prices like HDFC, Infosys, Tata Motors. So, you know, instead of having to pick just one company shares or two company shares, you can, uh, that, that is how much you'll be able to buy with 2000 rupees. But if you um, go in for mutual funds, uh, you know, with that 2000 rupees, you can get uh, exposure to many more companies. Uh, that was the point I was trying to uh, illustrate. So now, uh, okay, we know, you know, what are mutual funds, how they can be helpful. Uh, this is a very important question that actually comes up is, how do I go about investing in mutual funds? Should I do a one time bulk investment, like a lump sum? Or should I, you know, invest small amounts regularly into the mutual fund, you know, like maybe on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. That is called a systematic investment plan, right? So um, uh, there are two ways you can do that. Uh, of course, like I explained, SIP is repetitive. You invest, you know, small amounts uh, on a regular basis, whereas a lump sum is like a one-time investment, right? Uh, the... Uh, both have their pros and cons, of course, but with the SIP, uh, what happens is that you don't have to time the market, right? Uh, you, you, you don't have to wait like, oh my, uh, that equities might go up or down and then wait to, you know, invest your lump sum. You're, wherever the markets are, in a disciplined, systematic way, you invest a fixed amount monthly. Now, how does this actually help you? It brings down your, you know, average cost of purchasing because um, there could be months when the equity markets were high and you invested, say, 5,000 rupees. You'd get some lower mutual fund units because the markets were expensive. But the next month, if the market's corrected and you still invest your 5,000 rupees, now this time you'll get more units because the markets are cheaper, right? So because of this, uh, you know, movement of, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, purchase level of prices, uh, your average cost actually goes down with an SIP. And that is why uh, it's usually recommended to investors. Uh, this is uh, here, I've just tried to, you know, uh, reiterate what I said earlier that uh, it's not about how much money you have to start with, right? Because if you see, uh, I mean, uh, just 1000 rupees if you know invested at uh, at a certain rate of interest for 25 years can become a meaningful you know amount going forward right and of course if a monthly if you can do a monthly sip of 1000 and you can increase it to 5000 that's where you know the part where you should start saving more comes in you can see there's a huge difference over the years in the corpus levels so just remember small and regular saving will result in big outcomes Quickly to uh, take you through the types of mutual funds. Um, uh, so mutual funds can be classified, you know, on the basis of what is the organizational structure. Uh, you know, they could be open-ended or close-ended, which means, you know, open-ended wherein you can buy and sell uh, continuously, whereas close-ended ones um, give you a specific period in which you can invest and then uh, you cannot redeem it till the end of that period. Uh, 
Uh, then there are active and passive funds based on how the portfolio is being managed. If you know the fund manager is just buying stocks and securities uh, that are in the benchmark, you know, trying to give you benchmark-like returns, those are passive funds. Whereas funds, uh, you know, which um, invest in stocks other than the benchmark to be able to beat the benchmark, give you returns higher than the benchmark, they are classified as active funds. Um, uh, then there are growth oriented funds, you know, which are mostly equity oriented to give you to grow your capital. There are income funds, which, you know, um, uh, which, which have the aim of giving you regular income. Then uh, based on the asset class or the investment portfolio, there are funds uh, that invest in equity. So equity funds and debt funds There are hybrid funds, which invest in a mix of equity and debt. Right. And uh, there are other categories as well, like gold ETFs uh, or equity linked saving schemes, which are used for uh, tax saving. So uh, there are overseas funds, you know, which invest in international stocks and uh, uh, securities. So uh, this categorization, you know, uh, uh, has been given by SEBI. Um, uh, and, you know, this uh, the SEBI has under the equity category, for example, uh, it has defined uh, how, uh, the large, mid and small cap stocks, right? Uh, even the naming convention of the schemes uh, are now, you know, more representative of whatever is the underlying portfolio. Uh, and um, balanced funds or hybrid funds, which were earlier, you know, a very vague term has now been further classified, you know, uh, by SEBI into conservative hybrid fund, which has low equity exposure, balanced hybrid fund, which has a 50-50 exposure to equity and debt, and aggressive hybrid fund, which tends to have a higher exposure to equity than debt. So here we've just tried to, you know, uh, because there are so many types of debt funds and so many types of equity funds, we've just tried to kind of um, map it out for you in terms of um, what kind of return and risk you can expect from these particular categories, you know, in each of the debt and equity uh, areas. So in debt, for example, um, funds that, you know, invest in shorter term securities like overnight funds, liquid funds, ultra short term funds, um, they have lower risk, but they also have lower return. You move higher, uh, higher up the axis, uh, then you have, you know, short term bonds which are more of a medium uh, risk, medium return. Uh, they take exposure to medium term debt securities. And going ahead, you know, you can have guilt and bond funds. Uh, these invest in, uh, you know, longer duration debt securities. And because they are longer duration, they tend to have higher risk and higher return. Similarly, on the equity side, um, you know, uh, large cap funds, which invest in the big, you know, the big, uh, biggest companies of our country, they tend to have lower risk uh, compared to, uh, you know, mid and small cap funds uh, or mid and small cap stocks. And that is why large cap funds can give you medium return with medium risk. You move up higher mid and small cap funds because these are, you know, smaller companies, not much is known about them. There is an element of risk involved. So they are higher risk with higher return. And then there are even up, uh, up this ladder is our sectoral funds that, you know, take exposure to certain sectors like IT or pharma. And uh, these tend to be, uh, you know, very high risk and very high return because, uh, you know, uh, the prospects of a sector can change uh, uh, very soon. So uh, quickly to take you through, you know, what are the things uh, that you should check or go through before you invest in a mutual fund. Uh, so there's something called a scheme information document. Uh, it is, uh, it contains specific information of that particular scheme, uh, you know, so that you can take an informed decision to invest. There's a statement of additional information. This contains information regarding the mutual fund. Uh, it's common across all schemes of the mutual fund and it, it gives you information about that specific mutual fund house. Uh, we also have a key information memorandum, which is like a shorter abridged version of the scheme information document. This also can help you get all the key or essential information uh, that you need to be aware of before you invest. Uh, then there's something called a fact sheet that or also something you should go through. It helps you assess a scheme and keep uh, you know, track of what its performance uh, has been like. It is issued by the fund house every month. Uh, it's very easy to understand and provides a snapshot of you know, what the fund holds, what its performance has uh, been. Um, it gives you information about the returns, uh, the risk, you know, uh, who are the fund managers you know, that are managing the portfolio. 
Moving on to direct plans and regular plans, there are two ways in which you can invest in mutual funds. Uh, if you want to invest directly or you know, with the help of a registered investment advisor, you can opt for the direct plan of mutual funds, right? Uh, if you would like to go through your mutual fund agent or distributor, you, uh, you opt for the regular plan. Direct plan and regular plans have separate NAVs. The reason for that is they have different expense ratios. Direct plan has a lower expense ratio than regular plan because there is no distributor or agent involved here. You're dealing directly with the fund house. Uh, how can you invest? You can in, uh, in the mutual fund scheme, you can invest offline or online, um, right? Uh, there's a physical application if you would like to go uh, offline you have to submit you know fill that form and other documents and submit it uh, at you know these branch offices or designated investor service centers of the uh, uh, rtas right and online you can go to the uh, websites of the respective mutual funds uh, you know or uh, websites of your mutual fund distributors and um, you can invest in the online mode uh, how do you withdraw your money? Again, uh, both ways are available, offline mode to redeem and even online mode, right? Um, again, you can go uh, for the online mode, you can go on the website or the transaction page of the desired mutual fund. And for offline, there will be a form uh, that you need to fill up and submit at the RTA or the investor services center. You can withdraw full or partial amount as required. Now, uh, how can you, you know, evaluate the performance of a mutual fund? Um, see, a mutual fund provides relative return with respect to its benchmark. So that is one way you can, uh, you know, uh, judge the performance of a fund, whether it has been able to, you know, keep in line with its benchmark or give returns higher than the benchmark. That could be one way. Uh, also, the return of a fund should be measured over a period of time, right? Uh, because, um, for example, debt funds are generally held for shorter periods. Right. And equity funds are generally held for longer periods. So you don't want to be judging an equity fund, uh, you know, over its performance of just six months, because uh, that, that that wouldn't be correct. It's it's uh, uh, an equity fund should be given a, a more longer timeline, like about three years for you to be judging its performance. And also the return of fund has to be adjusted for the risk it has assumed, because, uh, you know, any fund can give you higher return by taking on higher risk. But that is not what you want. You want to. I mean, you, if, even if you want that, you need to, you, you need to be aware that uh, what kind of risk the fund has taken to give me the return that it has. And if you're not comfortable with that risk, that should, you know, uh, yeah, that should uh, be something you should uh, keep in mind. Um, then there is something called the net asset value or NAV of the mutual fund. What is it? It is the market value of all the funds, uh, holdings, you know, whatever the fund is invested in. It could be stocks, uh, it could be bonds or it could be gold in case of gold ETFs. So what, what is the market value of the fund's holdings minus any liabilities or expenses that the you know, uh, fund will have? Because there are expenses like you know, running the scheme, operating expenses, etc. So value of the underlying minus any liabilities and expenses, that is divided by the outstanding number of units that the scheme has issued. That gives you the value per unit or net asset value of the fund. It's important as it is the basis for valuing an investor's holding of units in a mutual fund and the relative appreciation of the same. Mutual funds are published daily on Amfi's website and even uh, 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 NAVs are uh, published, I'm sorry, uh, daily by uh, on Amfi's website by the mutual funds. Moving on to the product labeling, uh, like you can see, uh, uh, there are a lot of things that have been done by SEBI, which can be, you know, which you should actually look out for, uh, which can be a good indicator to you for, you know, what is the risk and return potential of the mutual fund that you're investing in. For example, we have the risk meter here, wherein, you know, uh, each fund has to, on this risk meter mark, you know, mark where it stands in terms of risk, right? So, for example, most equity funds would be high or very high risk and, um, Liquid funds would be like low to low to moderate risk. So this can be a good way for you to judge, you know, what kind of um, risk return, uh, you know, potentially you're actually buying into when you buy that mutual fund. Another important aspect I want to discuss is nomination. Nomination is a facility that enables an individual mutual fund investor to nominate a person who can claim the units held by him, you know, uh, in the event of his death, right? So in 
uh, this becomes very important because uh, if you don't have a nomination, then you know the passing of those units uh, becomes very tricky. And if you if you have a clear nominee, it's a much more uh, smoother process. Uh, so this here we highlight why nomination is important. Um, moving on to uh, complaints. If you do have any complaints, you can uh, contact the Investor Relations Office of the Mutual Fund. You know, uh, their details are available on the Mutual Fund's website. And in case you're not happy with the Mutual Fund's response, uh, SEBI has provided a centralized web-based complaints redressal system. Uh, it's called SCORES. So if you're not satisfied with the response of the fund, Mutual Fund House, you can get in touch, you know, with SEBI here and get your complaint uh, redressed. So uh, with that, I think uh, we've uh, come to the end of this uh, presentation and um, uh, uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions if there are any. Thanks, Mr. Jain. Uh, that was a brilliant presentation and I'm sure a lot of viewers would have got their facts sorted. So as we can understand, the basics of thoughtful investing starts with financial planning, as innocuous as it sounds, but the truth is that it requires a lot of diligent understanding of one's present financial resources, future goals, and how those financial resources can be utilized in pursuit of such goals. It's almost like a war strategy. Given this, how would you define financial planning for thoughtful investors? I think if I could put it simply, uh, I would say financial planning is a long-term strategy for intelligently managing your money. So you may accomplish your goals and objectives in life while you navigate the ups and downs that inevitably come at every stage of life. You also gave example of two gentlemen, ladies on the slideshow as to the models of investing pattern. That is investing early versus uh, starting late. Um, that actually highlights the importance of having uh, financial goals as well as plans. Uh, and uh, if you don't uh, have them, then there are certain pitfalls. Uh, and you would probably not be able to accommodate the required corpus for your needs. In that way, what would be the ideal four or five stages of financial planning that you would suggest? I think, like I said, uh, number one, uh, emergency fund, very, very essential. Uh, do not take the step for granted, right? Uh, once that is taken uh, care of, you define, prioritize your financial goals, right? Uh, start saving more, start saving now. That's step three, I think I would say. And um, of course, please make sure your investments beat inflation because that is the very purpose of you investing your money. Don't keep your savings idle. It's very important you know, um, that wherever you invest, you, you know, your money actually grows at a rate higher than inflation. And lastly, like I said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, please diversify your investments, you know, uh, figure out what is a suitable asset allocation for you and stick with it. Given this, what would be, what would you define as the first stage of uh, thoughtful investing? Now that we have a basic idea of uh, how you should go about uh, investing, that is have an emergency fund and then proceed with investing. So what would uh, what would you call as the first stage of investing? Um, I think, you know, sometimes what happens is, um, of course, saving comes before investing. So ideally, that's the first step because uh, you need to be saving to be able to invest. But uh, first uh, step of investing, I would say is, you know, one should not go about investing in a haphazard way and, you know, just put money uh, into whatever is uh, doing well or, you know, whatever your friend or, or your family member suggests. This is one thing I really want to uh, uh, mention. One should be, you know, very clear about their investment objective, time horizon, risk-taking ability, and only based on this, you, you can start your investing journey. So I think that kind of clarity as to what are you trying to achieve uh, that is the first uh, step, I would say, in this, whole, in this whole investment journey. So if I were to say I have to design a financial plan for my own investing goals, then how should I go about it? That is, if uh, I were to start 
with my own investment as someone who to start with his or her own investment. Of course, there are financial planners, uh, but suppose if somebody is in his or her first job, and then that person is unlikely to go to a professional financial planner, then how should uh, one go about making his or her financial plan mm. to start with? The basics, that is, after um, they have already made their emergency fund. Uh, so, uh, I mean, for someone just starting out, you know, with their career, I think equity should ideally make up the bulk of their investment portfolio, somewhere between 65 to 100%, because uh, they need their money to grow over and above inflation over the years. Also, because they have a long investment horizon, equities are again suitable because equities, though they are volatile in the short term, they tend to do well over longer periods of time. So someone just starting out long investment horizon, you know, uh, uh, bulk of the exposure, like I said, to equities. But of course, allocation should also be guided by your risk capacity, your risk appetite. And once you've zeroed down on an allocation, then it's, it's you know, it's... Um, very clear, you stick to that as asset allocation, save every month and, uh, you know, uh, don't get perturbed by the ups and downs. Uh, just uh, be disciplined and uh, keep investing and uh, uh, you will, you know, come out on the other side uh, much, much more financially uh, stronger. And talking of equities, um, the best thing for those starting out would be equity mutual funds rather than direct stocks. Um, there would be a fund manager to take care of the ups and downs in the market, uh, but someone not experienced or more, uh, most uh, likely a first time investor could actually end up losing all uh, his or her money in a downside. So that way a mutual fund is a much safer bet towards equity investing rather than uh, direct stocks for such kind of investors. 100%, yes. Now for someone who has been into investing and has been doing that for some amount of time, they would obviously uh, be having different baskets. Uh, but then how should they go about prioritizing their goals? Because their goals, resources, as, as well as their risk appetite uh, would change over a period of time. Yeah. So um, on different stages of your life, uh, uh, you know, how, how does this asset allocation or how could this change? So see, um, based on the risk we can take and the time there is to achieve the goal, there are, you know, different avenues to invest. For example, um, child's education, um, child's marriage, house, if those are the kind of goals that you know you are, uh, uh, that you have in mind, uh, your risk taking ability would be somewhere between moderate to high, depending on how much time there is to achieve that goal, right? So in that case, some avenue like hybrid mutual funds uh, can be a good option, um, which are a mixture of equity and debt. So they give you uh, the you know good returns because of the equity component, and there is some sort of stability that the debt component provides to you. So that is you know one example I can think of. Another is um, uh, like you mentioned, different stages of life. If I'm a young uh, investor looking at retirement as a goal, uh, my time horizon is very long. So like we discussed, equity-oriented mutual funds can be a good bet. But if I am a medium-age investor, you know where. Uh, retirement is my goal, but there is not, uh, you know, a lot of time left to achieve it. Again, hybrid mutual funds uh, with equity and debt could be a good way. And if I am again, you know, uh, uh, even more closer to my retirement goal, maybe it's three years away, two years away, that's when, you know, I can shift to actually non-equity funds, like debt-oriented funds, because that's when I don't want to be taking risk with my uh, capital, you know, I don't want to lose any capital and, you know, I, I want stability and I want regular income out of it. So, you know, I mean, for every goal based on the risk you can take and the time there is, you know, left to achieve it, uh, you, you're you going to have to like kind of, you know, uh, move around the, you know, the different mutual fund categories. But uh, I mean, all in all, uh, I think if I have to summarize, it would be a longer term asset allocation, more towards uh, equities, shorter term asset allocation, more towards, you know, non equities, more stable uh, uh, asset classes. My next question was on this line only. So how do you distinguish between certain long term and short term asset allocation? Uh, as in what qualifies certain assets as long-term and some as short-term and very simple terms? 
so long term goals require a different mix of asset classes because they need to be able to beat inflation right now these thus have to be in you know high risk high return asset classes right short term goals on the other hand um, you know you require asset classes that are comparatively more stable with lower chances of capital erosion right because you have lesser time to recoup those losses if any so equities can give you higher than inflation returns right in the long term but can be volatile in the short term so equities is more suitable for long term asset allocation debt on the other hand low risk low return right less volatile so it makes debt suitable for shorter term asset allocation or shorter term goals and um, medium term goals somewhere in the in, in the middle between these two can be achieved by a mix of these two asset classes and balance out risk and return i think that is uh, i mean the most fundamental way to you know define long term asset allocation and short term asset allocation uh that was a splendid way of explaining the difference in terms of the classification of long term or short term assets uh so someone uh looking for long term uh, growth uh, should go for equities and should not be perturbed about short term market fluctuations because they will uh, give a good uh, return in the long term as you showed in the slide show and someone looking for short term should go for debt and someone looking for short term um and somewhere in between uh, should go for hybrid so this is uh, the basic structure that they should follow uh thank you ms jen it was a pleasure talking to you with that we come to the end of today's webinar viewers we hope you enjoyed our conversations today uh, please don't forget to share your comments and feedback on this episode you can also share your suggestions and questions at letters at outlook money we'll be back with our next edition soon till then stay safe stay invested and keep following outlook money thank you thank you Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.